everyone. Welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we're finally going to get back to the video series where we mold this four-way black ABS shroud part. Uh, it's probably been about a month ago since I talked about this where we started to show the 3D machining. And now we're going to get back to finish the uh, parts being machined, individual parts like the ejector plates in part two of the series. And then a few days later, we're going to follow up with the conclusion, which is the final assembly of the mold. And these, and then there's a prequel episode where we showed the robots actually punching these parts out. So I'll put links to that episode and enjoy the show. Previously on Dragonfly Engineering, we showed the prequel where the robots molded these parts and trimmed them using a couple of uh, quick setups, as well as the 3D machining of the A and the B side, uh, mostly just sped up and played to music. So check those out on Dragonfly on previous episodes about a month ago. Alright, so this is the A side of the mold after it was machined on the previous episode. And we're going to flip it over and then effectively machine the back side so that it's square. And we need to dial in the location of the back of the mold. And I'm using basically a through hole that was precision machined and I'm finding the center of that hole by sweeping this indicator around until the needle indicates zero as you go around in a circle. And then you got to clean your parallels real good because you know the molded machine wants to have a nice square mold so it doesn't get uh, kind of bent out of out of square as it clamps up on your mold. So it's very important that effectively all four corners of the stack of the mold equal the same number within a thousandths or so or 25 microns so I'm a little careful with getting this square and then we will profile the back I'm double checking because I messed up the finding of the back on the previous mold insert anyway so uh, yeah we just blend the edge together with profile machining and then we're going to shell mill the top to be square to the, or the, we're gonna shell mill the back of the mold to be square to the front face of the of this side of the mold. And uh, basically, off camera, I just check the four corners with calipers to ensure squareness. Here we're gonna drill the center sprue hole. Oh, actually, no, this is the B side of the mold. So we are drilling the pilots for the clearance holes for all of the ejector pin holes that were drilled and reamed from the front side. I usually drill a larger clearance hole on the back because it's difficult in there. I actually test it with an ejector pin to make sure my hole lined up. Because uh, you know you can't. It's hard to drill small diameter ejector pin holes that are straight that go through a thick block. So you, I, I usually just drill half that's precision and then clear out the back with a drill that's 30 percent bigger. And then here I'm effectively squaring up the other mold half and the same story applies here that we need to have the uh, four corners be the same height so that the finished mold stack is, is square as it's loaded into the molding machine. So this is actually the back side of the A side of the mold. There I'm blowing some of the smoke out with the WD-40 that I'm using. A lot of times if you use a thin oil instead of coolant like water-based coolant you get a better finish. And then after the surface is squared, I'm going to find the exact center using this Heimner XYZ uh, position indicator. And basically you just move the, the black needle until it gets to zero and that flexes the ball at the bottom to half of its diameter or one radius. And then you just enter the difference of the two. So I'm using the you find the front and the back edge, and then you divide by two, basically, to find the center of your part. you got to make sure you deburr the edge. And if you don't want your red needle to go in that red section of the bottom indicator, otherwise you'll break your tip off. And those cost about 40 bucks. And now we're going to machine the alignment ring for the A side of the mold. And this is a program that I basically have saved for all the 6-inch molds. And it's basically just hogging out material all the way around and then it's going to leave a 110 millimeter in diameter alignment ring that the molding machine also has a 110 millimeter alignment ring in its A-side platen of the machine itself 
and you basically just key this 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 round boss which is you need to you know make it slightly less than 110 millimeters so take 50 microns or 75 microns off its diameter so that you can actually fit it into the molding machine without having to press fit it in uh, so I did the rough and now I'm going around and doing a finished profile for the 110 millimeter alignment ring minus a little bit so it fits after which we will then cut out the center area which results in a clearance for the injection nozzle of the molding machine to basically reduce the height of the sprue which is the, the hole that goes through the A side to create the flow of plastic. Here I'm setting up the tap to tap the mounting holes after we machine the center hole out. And I usually walk away, that's why there's a big rat's nest of chips. And yes, it's not good to recut your chips because it wears out your end mill, but uh, I find that it's cheaper to do other work, which costs more than the wear on an end mill. So I, I usually walk away, I don't have a horizontal mill. But here you can see I added more flood coolant to help clear away the chips. So after this profile and clearance of the nozzle for the molding machine is finished, we will plunge in a ball end mill and uh, maybe that happens after this drilling and tapping of the mounting holes. But a one inch ball end mill is plunged in the middle to create the actual nozzle seat that uh, creates the seal for the plastic to flow from the nozzle of the molding machine and into the A side of the mold. Here we're tapping with a 3816 tap four mounting holes. The A side platen of the molding machine has through holes on this particular machine so it's easy to mount molds you just run a bolt through the platen of the molding machine itself into these threaded holes that we're creating. Let's see if I actually showed the one inch ball end mill plunging in to create the nozzle. Maybe that's it right there. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so that profile of that one inch ball end mill matches the profile of the nozzle of the molding machine. And here I'm machining in from the backside some keyways for some aluminum wedges, which I wound up actually replacing the aluminum wedge with steel plates. Um, some of the features in the other side of this mold required sharp corners and I didn't want to EDM in sharp corners, so that's electric just charge machining. So I wound up machining these, these slots that we then, uh, I machined some, some tapered locking wedges to basically wedge some plates in from the backside to create a tapered or a drafted sharp corner on the other side of the mold. So that's what that is, and that's the wedge that I made. So the face of that wedge creates the backside or the shutoff surface on the cavities on the other side of this mold. I basically pounded them in from the back and there was all sorts of problems with them, which we'll get into in part three.
So we have all the components for the B side of the mold fabricated. That being the main body itself, or the main mold block, the B side block with the 3D profile. And then this is a pre made base that I had on the shelf, as well as these rails, which we did have to modify and add a clearance notch for the little outriggers on the on the ejector plates themselves. And then here I'm essentially assembling the mold in a way to test for the height of the ejector pins. So to do that, you gotta clean all the surfaces and basically stack the components on your B-side so that you can understand how or what length you need to cut your ejector pins to. So that means you gotta stick all of the pins in, or at least one of them, since all of these pins are the same height. Here I realized I'm using a set of pins from, an, from another project, so I had to set those aside, and then these uh, 1 16th pins in the background are the ones that are for this mold. So they're all going to be the same height, fortunately, so I'm basically just assembling with the lower ejector plate and testing the height of the pin, and we'll mark it and cut it. After I cut the pins with basically a wire cutter, like a junk wire cutter, I came over to the manual mill and I've, I've learned that instead of surface grinding these pins to height, I can actually just machine the tips of these ejector pins off using a, a carbide end mill. I think this is a half inch five flute carbide end mill, like a newer one. Uh, it can be a little rough on your end mills to cut these ejector pins because they are pre-hardened but they're still cuttable. And as it turns out, it's a lot easier to just load these guys into the fixture that you see here with a hard stop that I set up on an angle plate in the background. And yeah, you just machine the tips of these ejector pins off to dimension. Uh, when I was surface grinding, these smaller pins would have a tendency to snap the whole end off of the pin as it sticks out of the fixture. But with this setup, I can only expose like, you know, 100 microns of the pin and cut them all pretty much this fast. I think this is 4x speed, but you get the idea. Okay, so we got our machine parts finished for this mold set, and now we can assemble the parts. So first thing we're gonna do is drop these linear bearings into the machined holes, and these will help guide the two mold halves together. And let me get a rubber mallet. I'm gonna get it started there with my hand. Okay. So that pushed in pretty good, so I'm just going to tap it in place. Sometimes you need to pre-align these, these uh, inserts that you press fit into aluminum because the aluminum isn't super strong, so sometimes parts can lead off if they start in an, at an angle. So sometimes I'll use a one, two, three block, but this one in so easily that it should be squared up. So as this mold heats up, this insert may actually loosen up, in which case I can I can put a little ding in the aluminum at the top, which will kind of create a key to hold this sensor in place. Okay. One of these inserts is a tighter insert than the other. So the tighter insert will actually set the XY, and then the looser insert will help with tolerance, assembly tolerance, so that it's not too tight putting the molds together, and it'll fix the angle as well. So I'm not sure which one of these is tighter, but it doesn't really matter. All right, well that went in pretty easily. Okay. Oh, and I also off camera put these, these aluminum wedges in, which was quite a challenge. Uh, some of them required a bit of force to get in there. So if I have to adjust this mold, I'm probably gonna have to machine these, these uh, locking taper keys out of here. And I was worried I'd, that they may push out, but after the amount of work and hammering and clamping and tonnage I've used to get those things in there, I think they're going to stay in there forever, unless I machine them out, which I can just put it back on the mill and machine these aluminum parts out. It's no big deal. If this wall needs to move forward, then I'll have to make more of these, probably make them a little, a little looser, and then actually machine away the slot in the mold to bring this wall forward. But we'll see how our first parts look. Okay, so next is our B side and I need to press a couple of dowel pins into the B side that engage with the red bearings that we put on the A side. All right, so here's our dowel pin. It's a threaded pull-out dowel pin, half inch, and I'm going to press this guy into our pre-machined 
a pretty good interference fit, press fit for the um, pins here. And sometimes I'll heat these blocks up, but I'm kind of under a time crunch here. So in this case, I am going to just use the machinist square to start the pin in the whole square. And I'm checking both angles. And then I can use the, the Kurt vise over there to, to drive this pin home. And if it starts square, then it'll, it'll want to continue to be square as it goes into the machined hole. But as I just mentioned, if you start this pin crooked, it may actually just gouge a new hole into your aluminum. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start this with a tap. Hopefully not knocking it out of square. I did a little bit. Seems to wanna to tick tock back and forth. There we go. Now it's way off that way. So when I retire, I'll have time to wait at the at the stove for a mold to heat up and then wait for it to cool down. But for now, I'm just gonna try to push through. All right, so we can set our second pin. And then with the curved vise, we're probably gonna swell the aluminum out, you know, so there'll be a very, very subtle, probably bulge on the side of the mold from the interference of pushing the steel into the aluminum. All right, that looks good. Let's go over to the vise. I'm gonna drop our mold into the vise. I guess I can press until the top of the 3D features. <laughs> but this should press in relatively easily. Yeah, I'm not having any, any real trouble with it. But I do need to press it to at least the depth of the bearing. All right. Okay. There we go. Got our bearing pins pressed in. All right. I have a couple of screw heads that I'm going to push it or screw into here, which are going to be pusher posts against the return pins for the ejector plate. So we can worry about those in a second. But let's just see how our molds fit together. Ideally, the gap closes completely. There we go. That looks good. This discoloration you see is common for 7075 aluminum. When it touches cast iron or other low alloy steels, then it uh, reacts and it creates this black oxide coating on your, on your 7075 aluminum. 6061 doesn't do that. So if you're ever curious if you got the, the right aluminum, just see if it reacts with your vice. <laughs> well, I need to put pry marks or pry corners in this uh, mold. Hopefully I can get this back apart again. There we go. I think this one wants to go in square because these aluminum shutoff surfaces are a snug fit with these angled surfaces that we added into the mold with these pressed in keys from the back. Okay, so the next step is to assemble our ejector plate system, which uh, you saw how I had to have a couple of outriggers because uh, the, the parts are sticking kind of far out on the edges of our mold here. 
You know, so our, this pin and this ejector pin and these little drilled holes, uh, I need to basically compromise and put that little outrigger out there, which means that we need to, we had to machine a notch in our riser block or our rail to accommodate that, that little uh, extra bit of ejector plate that we have there. Okay. I do need to drill this to a 3 16th because our center sprue, our center ejector, yeah, sprue ejector is 3 16th of an inch. So I'll do that right now. Well, this seems like a good point to stop for this particular video since we're up at like 26 minutes or so. But stay tuned in two to three days from now, I should have the second half of this video where we conclude the build of this mold and then you can watch the prequel where we mold these parts. Oh, and also check out these new friends I found about a month ago in Tennessee. Oh yeah, we had a turtle that was uh, across our path. Yeah. These are baby red-headed woodpeckers. Are they pileated woodpeckers? I can hear this trunk cracking right now. Yeah.